Wow, where do I begin with this breakdown? This is going to be a breakdown that will be very extensive, it'll be very long, I will have a lot to say at the end of it, and I'll probably make many different videos regarding aspects of this episode as a whole, just to go into real detail on all of them. Now, my overall thoughts about the episode in its entirety was that it was fun. It was entertaining. It did a lot of really beautiful things that connected not only the characters to their past, but to also where they're going and opened up many more doors for where it could lead. And yes, spoilers, I'm talking about you, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. I think it did a phenomenal job with showing Anakin's evolution into this lesser form of Darth Vader who is still weakened by his connection to his former master, Obi-Wan. And I will be going over all of that in so many different videos and discussions with you guys in live streams and posts and other forms of content as well. So without further ado, let's get right into this breakdown. Thank you so much to everyone who is part of the watch parties and part of these breakdowns as well. I love making them, and I love being part of the community with everyone here. So, starting on Tatooine, we get Reva in disguise like some sort of a dark Jedi, foreshadowing her arc at the end of the episode as she does turn back to the light. As she takes the water out of the bully's hand, who I believe was the boss of the meat market that Obi-Wan was working at in episode 1, she interrogates the water merchant to find Owen. She knows who Owen is thanks to the Force putting them together randomly on Tatooine when she was interrogating everyone along with the fifth brother. If you guys remember, this is where she took the old lady's hand. Now, she watched Bail Organa's hollow message to Obi-Wan in the previous episode where she fought and lost to Vader. And she found out that Vader has kids and she's here to kill Luke knowing that he's the son of Vader, and if she takes Luke out, then she'll exact some form of revenge on Vader for terminating her youngling friends at the Jedi Temple during Order 66, of course, as Anakin. As we head into space, Vader tracks Obi-Wan and his Star Destroyer, and it's a beautiful shot. The music finally feels like Star Wars for the first time, really, as it sounds like the chase scene in Empire Strikes Back but of course a different rendition, just using some themes. Now the hyperdrive in Kenobi's ship is down, and Obi-Wan of course decides to leave the ship in order to save everyone. He knows that Vader is after him, and it'll draw Vader out. Saying goodbye to everybody, including Leia, we get ready for Kenobi to leave. Back on Tatooine, little Luke and Owen are found in a shop, reminding us a lot of Anakin in Watto's shop. And we're able to draw a lot of parallels and connections with Anakin and his son, Luke. Now the water merchant comes in and tells Owen that Reva is searching for him, and of course Owen knows that she's coming for Luke, so eventually he runs back home, tells Baru, and they get ready for him. Now, one thing in particular about that scene, and I'm jumping ahead a bit, is I really liked how he said Obi-Wan is nowhere to be found, and Baru says, yeah, whose fault is that? So it shows a bit of a polarity, I guess, a contrast between the two of them, that Baru was always more so in favor of Obi-Wan being around, while Owen wasn't. And of course we see this later on too, in A New Hope, where Baru tells Owen that he's got too much of his father in him, and Owen says, that's what I'm afraid of. Now Obi-Wan tries to speak to Qui-Gon one last time as he observes his lightsaber, saying it's me or him and one of us needs to die. So this is quite a line as Obi-Wan doesn't normally live with such absolutes, but he knows that Vader wants to kill him and if he doesn't succeed, then he'll fail Yoda, Luke, and every one of the Jedi who counted on him before. So Kenobi heads to the planet nearby as Vader falls for the bait and orders the ship to follow Kenobi as he takes his Lambda T4A Imperial shuttle down to meet Obi-Wan. The Grand Inquisitor disagrees with Vader for this move. Now I think if Vader went after the ship, he'd have ended Leia and Roken, who probably goes on to lead some sort of a rebellion or start a rebellion against the Empire. Maybe not the one that we know with Jin, but perhaps something. That was the vibe I was getting when Obi-Wan was talking to him, saying that, you know, you're a leader and there are not many of those left anymore. And Roken was like, I'm just getting started, and he smiles. So it kind of tells me that this guy is now going to be kind of like a Saw Gerrera, sort of, but he's going to start some sort of rebellion, perhaps. We'll see more of him. Maybe he'll meet up with Quinlan Voss, who knows. The whole episode jumps back and forth between Vader and Obi-Wan and Reva and her quest to kill Luke. So we're back on Tatooine and Reva arrives at the Lars homestead. They are ready for her with blasters. And then we jump back to Vader and Obi-Wan. For me, I just found this to be, I mean, I understand that they gotta do this. They can't just show Obi-Wan and Vader the whole time. But I think in this sort of a moment, it's very hard to have a scene just as exciting and tense filled 
as Obi-Wan and Vader fighting when you switch to Reva trying to kill Luke when we all know that Luke is just going to be fine. And I think that's one of the main problems with having, you know, the kids be around is that you know they're going to be okay. So it's kind of like, you know, you know the ending before it really starts. Have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? I will do what I must, says Obi-Wan. The same line he says to Anakin on Mustafar 10 years ago. As he gets into his Kenobi Clone War stance, I really gotta talk about some things here. So this is the same stance that he tried to fight Maul in on Tatooine a few years later, until he changed his stance to the Qui-Gon Jinn one a second after that. So this shows, in my opinion, that Obi-Wan is still not as evolved as he will become later on in his life, clearly having learned more from Qui-Gon's ghost and adapting his fighting stance more than his own, showing an elevated level of self. I'm not sure if this was their intention, but I'm drawing the connection here for myself. So with this stance, it means Kenobi is pretty much as powerful as he was in Revenge of the Sith, like when he fought Grievous, where he did this exact same pose. So he's back now and ready to fight Vader. Maybe not as super powerful as he was in Revenge of the Sith, but pretty darn close. Then you will die, replies Vader, as he charges Kenobi, and we get them fighting with intense aggression and speed against one another. I was all for it, it was a sick scene, and I'm glad that they used some actual anger and aggression when they were fighting each other. Keep in mind, this is Vader's body. He's immobile, and this is really pushing his bad, outdated cybernetics to the absolute limit, as Sidious gave him the literal worst mechanics in order to subdue him and punish him for losing to Obi-Wan Kenobi on Mustafar. Now, in the old Legends books, which I know is Legends, Vader was so immobile that he couldn't even raise his hands over his head. So all of this is a stretch for him, all these movements. In the Brotherhood novel, which is canon, it explains Anakin's new robotic hand lags a lot behind his organic one. So I can only imagine how Vader feels here. They get back to back like in their training flashback scene on Coruscant. A lot of their fights are still mimicking their training as Anakin and Obi-Wan did in the good old days. And it's a nice connection showing, you know, what was and what now is while still using their choreography. Showing that, you know, these are still the same two guys. And I think this show did, this episode in particular, did a great job of connecting Anakin Skywalker into Darth Vader. And showing that he is quite pathetic. Kenobi and Vader go at it, shredding rocks with their sabers, throwing boulders at each other with the Force. As Kenobi drops a massive stone on Vader, who only shows him up in the Force by tossing it aside. It seems whatever Vader lacks physically, he makes up for in the Force. He performs a Hulk smash with the Force breaking the floor as he gets the high ground on Kenobi, throwing boulder after boulder upon him, trapping Obi-Wan. Thinking he's dead, Vader calls him Master one more time before they meet again, probably on the Death Star. You know, that is until they maybe fight in a Kenobi Season 2, who knows, I don't know. Reva fist fights Owen and Brew as Luke gets away running into the desert. She's pretty injured at this moment, and how she's alive really just surpasses my understanding. I don't think it's logical at all, but hey, carry on. Reva chases him through the desert. Hopefully Luke didn't see her lightsaber when he was climbing the ladder. It would really change things for A New Hope when he does see his father's lightsaber as Obi-Wan gives it to him. I checked back a few times and I don't think Luke actually saw it. Maybe he saw the red glow, but well, he's 10 years old and you know, how much do we really remember when we were 10, but this is a pretty traumatic event. Obi-Wan has a hard time as he's collapsing under the pressure of the boulders. When he hears voices of Anakin from their duel on Mustafar, then from their training on Coruscant and from Vader now all mixed together, he crumbles in defeat until he remembers his purpose, Leia, and his purpose in life now to protect Luke and Leia, to live for a new hope. He is the last line of defense for both of them, for the Jedi, for Yoda. This gives him enough power and belief in himself to fight for something important as he sends the boulders sky high and breaks out of there. Now I know Star Wars fans in the watch party had an issue with this part as he sneaks up on Vader. I think it's because he's using the force to stealthily move up to him, but of course Vader feels it. Now Jedi can suppress their footsteps and use the force to sneak around. Kenobi is using some of Anakin's old moves, behind the back twirl and spins, he's using form 3 Sarisu, there were 7 lightsaber forms and Obi-Wan was proficient in the third, but he's very offensive here, and that's interesting because Sarisu is a defensive form. So this isn't all that much like Obi-Wan, which is pretty cool, it shows more of an evolution in his fighting style and his character. He bests Vader and beats him up, destroying his control box with the butt of his lightsaber hilt, monitoring his breathing which is now troubled like in Return of the Jedi. 
With a final jump and swing to Vader's helmet, he destroys the left side of his face, whereas Ahsoka destroyed the right side in Rebels. This is kind of poetic because it shows that their efforts weren't enough to turn Vader back into Anakin, but Luke's was. He was the only one to remove his father's helmet by showing mercy, which funny enough is what Anakin said wasn't how you win a fight. Much to learn you still have. We see Anakin, Hayden's face, as Obi-Wan drops his guard and is brought to tears as he cries for Anakin. Vader says, Anakin is gone. I am what remains. And we get James Earl Jones' voice mixed in with Hayden's in a sort of computerized, broken Vader breathing voice. It is so haunting. It is so cool. I loved it. The scene is very sad. Obi-Wan tells him, I'm sorry, Anakin, for all of it. And we remember everything. We remember the prequels, we remember the Clone Wars, we remember all of their times together. This is where I feel the directing really, really shone through, as we see the reflection of blue and red on Anakin's face from, of course, Vader's saber and Obi-Wan's. But it's kind of going back and forth in different moments as Anakin is speaking, and we see that portrayed in his conflict. This is the conflict between the light and the dark, between Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader. Vader tells him he is not his failure, that Obi-Wan didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. He himself did. Vader did. And I will destroy you, as he looks sadistic and psychotic. Now, his eyes were blue, and then they changed to Sith yellow. Why is this? Well, I believe this is because he is conflicted. He wasn't fully tapped into the dark side. His feelings for his old master make him weak, as Palpatine says at the end of this, which was so cool to see Ian McDermott again. He looks great. So we can tell that Vader is consumed by hatred and Anakin is still here, but he's twisted and turned by the dark side. Obi-Wan says in pity, then my friend is truly dead, as he walks away. He knows Vader is no longer a threat and just feels sorry for him. There's no need to kill someone that he's beaten now twice. It's inconsistent with what Kenobi tells Luke to do later, to kill his father, but maybe Vader goes super psycho powerful over the next 10 years and Obi-Wan changes his mind and is like, ah damn, I should have killed him actually this time. Now, who knows what story they will make for Vader going forwards, but all I can say is, yeah, it's inconsistent, but it also makes sense that Obi-Wan just pitied him, and he couldn't bring himself to actually kill Anakin. Now, the scream Vader does for Obi-Wan tops the Maul Kenobi scream for me. It's haunting, and it's very full of rage and pain at being beaten and pitied. This is kind of a Goku leaving Frieza on Namek move. So Obi-Wan leaves, and he senses Luke is in trouble. Now, how he leaves the planet without the Star Destroyer noticing, I don't really know, but... Hey, whatever. Perhaps the Star Destroyer went off to find Roken, and Vader is in his ship. Reva uses the Force to knock Luke out. As she goes to kill him, she sees her younger self in his place, and she sees flashbacks of Anakin and Vader. She is becoming who she hates, who she swore to destroy. So she stops herself, and we see her bringing Luke to the Lars and Obi-Wan as she kneels before them. Luke is okay, and he goes off with the Lars family as Kenobi and Reva discuss things. She's turned back to the light now, and it's the typical bait and switch. I feel this would have carried better had we maybe seen her for another season and then she changed a little more progressively. I understand why she turned, it makes total sense to me, but it's just a bit too quick in six episodes. You know, we just met her. So maybe if they did this over the course of 12 episodes or maybe even 10, maybe showing a little more progression as she was being conflicted with her present life and her past and what she really wants and who she really is. Well, I guess she's going to get her own show now, so we'll find out more, maybe a backstory or who knows. She cries about Anakin terminating the Jedi and her friends and wonders if she's become him. So Obi-Wan comforts her. He says that she's given her Jedi friends peace. She's honoring the Jedi by letting Luke live and by the choices she's making now. That she chooses not to become Vader and who she becomes now is totally up to her. This is quite like a Dumbledore quote that I love. It is not our abilities who make us who we are, Harry, but our choices. Reva drops her Inquisitor lightsaber as Obi-Wan says, Now you're free. We both are. So what does Obi-Wan mean by this? Well, he means that he is free because he faced his fears with Vader and got closure when Vader told him he didn't fail him, that Vader killed Anakin by choice. So he doesn't feel all that bad anymore. If Anakin wants to be like that, then that's his choice. Obi-Wan's tried. On Mustafar, we see Vader speaking to the hologram of the Emperor. Palpatine senses his conflict and questions if his thoughts on this matter are clear. His agitation is all too evident. Now remember, Palpatine can 
pretty much read minds. He can feel emotions very easily. Sidious says, perhaps your feelings for your old master have you weakened. Vader sits up straight, pauses, and says, Kenobi means nothing. I serve only you, master. Cue the Imperial March. Finally, this is Vader still learning. He's still figuring things out. It's still Anakin in there quite a bit. He's letting go of Anakin Skywalker, but it's very difficult, and it's not as accomplished as it will be in the original trilogy ten years from now. He's weak, he's conflicted, and more so Anakin now than in Rogue One, or A New Hope, or any of the other films. So much training he still has. On Alderaan, Leia dresses in boots and gloves, wearing Tala's holster, and we see her character change into who Leia will become in the original trilogy. A warrior. A rebel. Obi-Wan visits Leia and delivers Lola, her droid that she left with him. He tells her about Padme and Anakin, and how she's like them both. Of course, not mentioning their names, but saying that she's very much like her parents. Now, he doesn't mind wipe her to forget about him, which I thought would be a big issue, but it's fine when he tells her to never tell anyone about their relationship, as it'll endanger both of their lives. Obi-Wan tells Bale, if you ever need my help again, you know where to find me. And this is, of course, a beautiful call forwards to help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. You served my father in the Clone Wars, etc. Kenobi packs up on Tatooine to eventually move to his hut, which we will see him in in A New Hope. He probably doesn't get it yet, but there's going to be a bit of an adventure that he's about to go on, which I hope that we're going to see in some spin-off show or season two or whatever it might be. As he delivers the toy ship to Luke, the Lambda T4A Imperial shuttle that we see Luke Skywalker play with at the start of A New Hope, Obi-Wan agrees that Luke needs to be a boy and that the future will take care of itself. Obi-Wan is confident again. He's confident in his abilities to protect Luke, to protect himself, and to handle things accordingly as a Jedi. He is the hopeful and happy Alec Guinness Obi-Wan from A New Hope. Owen lets Obi-Wan meet Luke for the first time with a hello there. We see Obi-Wan in his Mythos statue attire, which is really fun to see, of course, with the goggles and everything. So this means, I think, that he must have Qui-Gon Saber somewhere with him. And of course, speaking of my favorite Jedi, Qui-Gon Jinn, bringing me to tears finally in the show, we finally see Liam Neeson in his old Jedi robes once again. He appears and tells Obi-Wan that he was always here, Obi-Wan just wasn't ready to see him. Meaning that Kenobi was too depressed and in his own fear, which is a path to the dark side, and in Obi-Wan's case he's not going to turn to the dark side, but it's definitely going to shift his ability to be perceptive to things in the Force. In order to see and turn on the light, he had to believe. And once he faced his fears, that being Vader, and overcame them, he believed in the Force again. He could then see Qui-Gon Jinn, who had apparently always been there, as Qui-Gon Jinn tells him, Come on, we have a ways to go. Walking into Beggar's Canyon, which is the same place Anakin raised his pod in, in The Phantom Menace, which started everything off. I thought that was a really nice touch, and I really loved seeing Qui-Gon Jinn once again. Now, was the season perfect? No, absolutely not. Are there problems with it? Absolutely. Is it something George Lucas would have created? Probably not. But did I like it? Were there parts that really helped embellish the story and evolve the characters? And the answer to that, for me, is yes. Overall, it did help the characters in many ways. More ways than it damaged them, I think. Did it affect the canon? Yeah, a little bit. Should Qui-Gon be able to appear as a Force ghost? Probably not. But you know what? This is Disney Star Wars now, and I honestly want to see these stories of Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan. We're living in a different time, and I gotta adapt to it. And while I'll still criticize everything, of course, I have to say I did feel like a nine-year-old again when I got to see Liam Neeson. It's a cheap parlor trick, but hey, it worked on me just because of how amazing the prequels were for me. Now, mainly a lot of the emotional moments were just me remembering the prequels. And that's testament to the beautiful effect that the prequels had on me as a kid, and how great of a story George Lucas had made. Now, of course, when we have a story about Obi-Wan Kenobi, it's going to require us to look on the past in order to continue the present and move on to the future. And when we think of the past, of course, we think of everything that came before, which is the prequels. So it does make sense why these callbacks and special characters returning would make us so emotional. I hope that we get to see more of them. I hope we get to see more of Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon's adventures. And of course, I hope we get to see more of Vader's journey into letting go of Anakin Skywalker as much as he can. 
Really enjoyed this episode. I hope you guys did too. Stay tuned for the many videos that I'm about to make and the many different live streams that we're about to have discussing all of the things in this episode. Things we didn't like, things we did, and just coming together as a Star Wars community and having some fun. Until then, remember, the Force will be with you. Always. <laughs>